Okay, I think uh, we can restart. I think I want to spend some introduction for words uh, uh, for Lior. Uh, Professor Lior Kronik is presently a faculty member of the Weizmann Institute of Science uh, in Israel. Uh, he's uh, the chair of uh, Katzman Professorship and also the director of the Beck Center for Advanced and Intelligent Materials. Uh, he also has a long history of important contribution to this field, especially to the development of uh, um, more accurate uh, energy functional for DFT. And he's certainly one of the main developer and expert of uh, hybrid functionals, um, or maybe which uh, he will talk about today. Uh, and this uh, gave him the opportunity, of course, uh, to contribute uh, in many fields, in many uh, for for the study of many uh, uh, technologically relevant problems and fields uh, in the simulation of uh, materials for uh, for energy, for example, which I guess uh, he's also going to talk about today with his talk that is entitled "Electronic and Optical Spectra." From, optical, from optimally tuned functional, the importance of exact constraint. Uh, Leo, Leo is, uh, the, floor is your, the floor is yours. Thank you, Matteo, for this very kind introduction. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Okay, yes. very good. So let me start, of course, by thanking the uh, organizers for putting this uh, uh, wonderful workshop together and for including me in it. And uh, I will talk about optimally tuned functionals as an approach which is useful for electronic and optical spectra. You will see that it has some similarities and some differences to what uh, uh, Professor Marzari talked about in the previous lecture. Uh, so that was a splendid lecture. Uh, talking after Nicola is a tough act to follow, but I will do my best. And with this, let's get started. So in Nicola's talk, you've already seen the uh, Quan-Shem equation, which is basically, as Nicola ex uh, already explained, an exact mapping to a single particle problem, which is in principle exact, but in practice needs to be approximate. And of course, we don't know what the exact exchange correlation energy and therefore potential are, but we do have useful approximations that can already get a large number of problems uh, done very, very well with predictive accuracy. So that's the good news. The bad news, which really Nicola also referred to, is that there are some notable failures. And let me briefly mention some of them. Of course, there are also others. One of them is the so-called band gap problem. And that is that if you look at the Quan-Sham gap, namely the difference between the energy of the highest occupied orbital and the lowest unoccupied orbital, it is in principle not the same as the fundamental gap, namely the difference between the ionization potential and the electron affinity, even if you had the exact magical functional. And the reason is that there is this property of the potential that I will talk about a bit more later, known as the derivative discontinuity, which means that it jumps by a constant as we go across an integer number of particles. If I extract an electron, I approach this integer from below, but if I add an electron, I approach it from above. Therefore, this contribution is missing. And that means that the Quan-Sham eigenvalue picture doesn't mimic a quasi-particle picture even in principle. So this was pointed out already in the early 80s, was a bit controversial for a while, but since then has been confirmed by a large set of uh, numerical calculations and by now is a consensus. So that's one issue. Another issue is that even when uh, exact theory should work well, approximations don't always work well in practice. So for example, a time-dependent DFT is an important extension of DFT, which is a ground state theory to the excited state. And in particular, using linear response, it is known to give good uh, optical absorption spectra for many molecules. But if we look at a solid, say silicon, we see that with a functional like PBE, there's a significant underestimate of both the indirect and the direct gap, which is consistent with my previous slide. But you also get the wrong optical absorption spectrum compared to that of, say, many body perturbation theory in orange here, which compares well with experiment. 
but TDDFT based on PBE is actually really wrong. It starts with way too low energies and also the line shape is completely distorted. So that is of course a serious issue too, which I will get back to. Then there's also the charge transfer excitation problem, which Nicola referred to a little bit also. And that is that if you look at molecules, typical valence interactions can be well described, but then charge transfer excitations, for example, in this model dipeptide from David Tozer and co-workers, if you look at excitations corresponding to transfer of an electron between one unit and another in this dipeptide, they are actually seriously underestimated with standard functionals by almost a factor of two compared to what you get, say, with a good wave function-based method. So that's uh, also a problem. Here's another problem, which is maybe not as familiar, but has been pointed out by Neaton, Hybertson, and Louis already a while ago. And that is that if I pack a set of molecules into a molecular crystal, say benzene into a, a solid benzene, same here for pentacene in the middle and C60 on the right, then the band gap should actually shrink by a lot. This is known as band gap renormalization. It's really a dielectric effect. It comes from the fact that as I try to pull an electron out or bring an electron in from a molecule, the rest of the molecules surrounding it serve as a dielectric uh, medium, which basically polarizes uh, the system and therefore makes it easier to extract an electron and also easier to add one so the whole gap shrinks, basically due to an image charge. This is well captured by many body perturbation theory again, which calculates the dielectric response explicitly as part of its process. But unfortunately, DFT is quite, quite blind to it. Here is PBE. You may think, well, maybe it's better with a hybrid functional. So here are two of them, HSC and PB0, and no, still blind. You can get sometimes accidental agreement, depending on the material and the functional, but it's generally a cancellation of errors between a band gap that is too small at the molecular level and the lack of, the, of being able to follow this renormalization. So what we've discovered over time, I don't think we understood it right away, but over time we've discovered that using an approach called optimal tuning, we can actually offer a unified approach that can solve all of these problems, even though they seem to arise from different origins. And the approach rests on three principles, which I will now describe. One is generalized Consham theory. The other is insisting on the exact asymptotic potential. And the third is, the ins is insisting on the ionization potential theory. So let's go one by one. What is generalized Consham theory? The easiest way to understand that is to think about standard hybrid functionals. In a standard hybrid functional, we have the same kinetic ion and heart return as in the standard Consham equation. But then we only include a fraction of semi-local exchange and a fraction of explicit Fock exchange, which is a non-multiplicative operator. It's an integral, like in uh, Hartree-Fock theory. And then there's correlation. So these are used extensively in DFT. In fact, I just showed some results in my previous slide. However, they are, if you think about it, really outside Consham theory, because Consham theory only includes multiplicative potentials, and the Fock operator is non-multiplicative by definition. So initially, this was thought to be, yeah, well, yet just another uncontrolled approximation on top of the formal framework. But it turned out a few years later, and the fundamental paper here is this Zydel at all paper from 1996, that actually there's a generalized theory which would map the original interacting system not to a non-interacting system like in the Consham case, but rather to a partially interacting electron gas, but one that is still represented by a single Slater determinant. If one follows the math, one can then show that this actually becomes a proper uh, density functional. It's outside Consham theory, but that's not synonymous with being outside DFT. And let me just say that more recently uh, with Roy Baer, we've generalized this to time-dependent DFT and with Tim Gould to ensemble DFT. So it really is a broad theory. Now, there's the hope that because we can now map to many different partial interacting electron gases, and I'll have more to say about that in a moment, we can choose one that eliminates the derivative discontinuity and then maybe we can get the gap right. To understand in a bit more detail what that would actually mean, let's look at exact hybrid theory. 
In exact hybrid theory, one would start with a functional of the Slater determinant that includes the kinetic energy and the fraction of the Coulomb repulsion. This would lead to an operator which includes the kinetic energy, a fraction of Fock energy, and a fraction of Hartree energy. And then generalized Consham theory really says that there's a, another uh, additive potential, which is known as the remainder potential, which one can add to this and make the theory exact again in the usual DFT sense, in the sense that the density coming out of the occupied orbitals will be the same as the density of the original system. In fact, in approximate hybrid theory, we choose to approximate this remainder functional as the remaining part of the Hartree operator, and then the remaining fraction of semi-local exchange and then semi-local correlation. So how does this work in practice? We can take a simple system like this closed shell F minus I, yeah? and we can solve the generalized Consham theory backwards. In other words, take a high quality density, in this case from quantum Monte Carlo calculations, and solve it backwards for many choices of alpha to figure out what would be the uh, remainder potential that would result in the correct density. And as you can see, it is quite a strong function of alpha. For alpha equals zero, which is really the Consham system, it is one thing. For alpha equals one, which is full heart refoc plus a remainder potential, it is another thing. So which one of those is the correct one? The blue, the green, the red? Well, the answer is actually all of them. All of them conspire with a different way to Fock exchange to produce the right density. And this is what I mean by having flexibility in the mapping. So, okay, so I have flexibility in the mapping, but still what would I choose, for example, to get the band gap right? So this takes us naturally to our second principle, which is insisting on the exact asymptotic potential, which is one over R. And it stands to reason that we would insist on that because if we're trying to describe electrons where we take an electron out all the way from the system or bring it in all the way into the system, it better feel the exact asymptotic potential. Standard functionals don't do that, and the only way to get that even with a hybrid functional is to insist on having a 100% Fock exchange, which is not a good idea generally because then you have, a, in approximations, a poor balance between exchange and correlation. So that brings us to another key concept, and that is the range-separated hybrid functional, which is a lovely idea due to Andreas Savin which starts with a very simple realization. It says that, well, we can take the Coulomb repulsion and we can basically uh, write it as a sum of a short range term and a long range term, for example, with the help of the error function, which is only significant in the long range and the complementary error function, which is only significant in the short range. Now, as written, this is nothing more than a trivial identity because the error function and the complementary error function are one by definition. But now we will treat the two parts differently. We will treat the long range part with Hartree Fock theory. So basically insist on 100% Fock exchange. And we will treat the short range part, say with GGA theory. So we will retain a balance of exchange and correlation where it matters, which is mostly in the short range. This leads us to the following generalized Consham equation, which is the usual kinetic ion and Hartree term and then only long-range Fock exchange, only short-range GGA exchange, and uh, correlation. So this actually gets the correct asymptotic potential by definition while still retaining reasonable correlation. Now here we still have a question, and that is what's short-range what's short and what's long-range, or in other words, how would we choose this parameter gamma here? Well, it can be done by fitting to some thermochemistry set, and this is in fact what was done in various ways in some of these early papers that are cited on the slide. But A, this uh, is still empirical, and B, I will show you later that for uh, spectroscopy, this is not good enough. So then there's a question, well, how would we do that? So for that, we return to our triangle of uh, three principles, and let's now discuss the one that we haven't so far, which is the ionization potential theory. So what is that? So Nicola already introduced the requirement of piecewise linearity. And as he explained in an answer to a question that he was asked, piecewise linearity is really the reflection that if I have a fractional number of electrons, say three and a quarter, what this really means is a statistical ensemble of three electrons and four electrons. And so I basically have a weighted average between them. 
That's basically the gist of it. The proof given here by Perdue, Parlevi, and Baldus a long time ago is a bit more subtle, but that's the gist of it. And by the way, if you don't like ensembles, never mind. There is still a pure state proof given many years later by Wei Tao Yang and co-workers. And in this tutorial article that I wrote a couple of years ago with Stefan Kummel, we uh, compare and contrast the two proofs. Okay. So if you buy that, then we also know that there is Yamak's theorem, which says that the eigenvalue is just the derivative of this curve, the, or the leading eigenvalue, the highest occupied one, is just the derivative of this curve with respect to the occupation of that particular orbital. So the derivative of a piecewise linear curve is just a stair-step curve. That's really the demand for the constancy of, in this case, the highest occupied orbital that Nicola was also mentioning. And in particular, it means that the highest occupied value eigenvalue will just be the slope of this line here, which by definition is just the difference between the energy of the neutral and the cation, so basically minus the ionization potential. Now, this is uh, often called Kupman's theorem because it is reminiscent of Kupman's theorem in, in the hartree fock theory. I usually refer to it as the ionization potential theorem. It's really the same thing, but that's to underscore that here, this is an exact relation. It's an exact theorem within an in principle exact theory. Whereas in the original hartree fock theory, this was an approximate theorem that neglected orbital relaxation within an in principle approximate theory, which is hartree fock theory. So how would we go about using that idea? So this brings us finally to the concept of optimal tuning, which I started exploring in a wonderful collaboration with Roy Baer and, uh, and, and Tamar Stein, who was then a PhD student working with both of us. And so here's the idea. So I have this ionization potential theorem. So for each choice of gamma of the range separation parameter, I can go ahead and calculate the left-hand side, namely the highest occupied eigenvalue. I can go ahead and calculate the right-hand side, so the difference between the cation and the neutron, and I can ask myself whether they're the same or not. If yes, I'm good. If not, I can keep looking. Now, there's no such theorem on the electron affinity, again, owing to this derivative discontinuity business, but I can choose gamma to satisfy a similar uh, constraint on the anion, which would mimic that, and then I have two conditions with one, one variable, so I can minimize it and say the least square sense, and I can pick a winning value. Now, the point that I really cannot emphasize enough is that by doing that, I am not fitting anything. I'm not fitting experiment. I'm not fitting uh, some uh, different theory, say quantum Monte Carlo or GW or whatever. All I'm doing is insisting on fulfilling an exact condition within my functional. So while I will get different numbers for different systems, I am tuning the range separation parameter, not fitting it, and this is not an empirical procedure. Let's see how it works in practice. So here's one example molecule. It's H2TPP. For the chemist, this is free-based tetraphenyl porphyrin. For the physicist, well, it's a molecule. It doesn't really matter for our purposes. And uh, let's see how it works. Well. So here's epsilon homo plus the ionization potential, absolute value of the rov as a function of gamma. And you can see that there is a very clear spot where it goes to zero. Here's the same for uh, the anion. Here's their sum. And as you can see, there is clearly a best value. We call this the optimal range separation parameter. Once we found it, we will freeze it. We will not alter it again. And we will go ahead and calculate various quantities. So here we go. For this gas phase molecule, I actually chose this one in particular because there were good reference data, both experimentally for the highest occupied, for the ionization potential, for the electron affinity, and also for the optical gap, which is the minimal energy required uh, to excite an electron. As you can see, the optical gap is much smaller here than the fundamental gap by more than a factor of two. And that is correct. That's because when I excite an electron, I leave a hole behind. So there is significant electron hole attraction, which lowers the energy. You can see that a many body perturbation theory approach, while expensive, captures that quite well, quite accurately. You can see that GGA actually, with time-dependent DFT, gets the optical excitation very well, but the eigenvalues are the homo and the lumo are very far from the ionization potential and the electron affinity. And use of a standard hybrid functional like B3LIP makes this somewhat better. 
but far from great. Now, finally, with our optimally tuned range separated hybrid approach, so basically Sabin's range separated hybrid, but with an optimal choice of the range separation parameter based on the ionization potential theorem, you see that we have everything. We have the ionization potential, we have the electron affinity, and we have the gap. Now, actually the same thing, the same approach precisely with no change whatsoever fixes other issues. For example, it automatically fixes the charge transfer problem because we have the correct asymptotic potential. So we, we've done that actually early on. That was our original motivation, but here I will show you newer work, in this case from the group of Bredov at uh, Bonn University. And the reason is because, you know, one idea of a useful method is that others can use it too. So here, uh, yeah, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, and Bredov are studying this very large complex, which has a large macro cycle in the middle and then some tail groups. And they find that there are two excitations, or experimentally, they know that there are two excitations there, one valence and one of a charge transfer nature, which is the one shown here, basically from the macro cycle to the tails, and they have similar energies. So they check what time-dependent DFT and with some GW methods, what would actually describe both transitions. And they find that only two methods are capable of that. One of them is GW BSC actually with some iteration on the green function. So not even a standard GW, which is not accurate enough. That's the one here. And range separated hybrids, but only with optimal tuning. If you take the same range separated hybrid, but without optimal tuning, actually your charge transfer state is way, way off. Whereas if you tune it, which is this value here, you're in business. Here's a second and, and more recent example from Ben Janesco. Uh, uh, Janesco looked at this particular pigment, which is a type of a perylene diemide, and it is known experimentally to fluoresce in the green. You can see the experimental color up here. So what Janesco did is he then took time-dependent DFT with a large uh, group of functionals, he calculated the optical absorption spectrum, and then there is simple software that takes into account the sensitivity of the eye and tells you what color it would actually be viewed as based on the optical absorption spectrum. And then he shows that depending on the functional that I would choose to use, I can go anywhere between rather deep red and rather deep blue which of course limits predictive power and uh, Janesco in his paper called this a rainbow of errors. But the idea here is actually not uh, to uh, disparage time-dependent DFT. On the contrary, notice that if you use this optimal tuning approach, which I just mentioned, which is this uh, line here, OTLC omega PB in this case, this is actually the one closest in color to experiment. The second closest, this can be through lip, but that one actually doesn't capture uh, charge transfer excitations very well because it doesn't have full asymptotic exchange, so no correct asymptotic potential. So that's a bit about molecules, and now I would like to turn to the solid state. So we do that gradually. First, we begin with molecular crystals, which is kind of an intermediate case. I already showed you that we have this problem of lack of capture of normalization. And in fact, this problem persists if we use our approach. We would get now the right molecular gap, but it would not renormalize. It would remain too high. Why? What are we still missing? Well, what we're missing is our second principle, the asymptotic potential, because we said that we must adhere to it. But if we have a solid, the asymptotic potential is no longer 1 over r with periodic boundary conditions. It's really 1 over epsilon r, with epsilon being the static dielectric constant. So we therefore go ahead with a different partition. We start again with the Savin idea of the error function and the complementary error function. But then we treat the two parts differently. Now in the long range, we will only take one over epsilon of Fock exchange and the rest with GGA. In the short range, as in a standard hybrid, we will take some fraction alpha of, uh, of um, Fock exchange and the complementary fraction of GGA exchange. So we have a hybrid in the short range, a hybrid in the long range, but not the same one. And importantly, we now include the screening and again, this is not still not empirical because epsilon can be and is calculated separately from density functional perturbation theory, so it's still predictable. So if we do that, oh, before that, let me mention that the importance of the dielectric constant in DFT is now being increasingly recognized. There is definitely related group, at least from the group of groups of Shimazaki, Gali, Ulrich, and also others. 
but if we incorporate it here in the way that I just uh, explained, we actually get this, which is part of a long going collaboration with a group of Jeff Neaton, in this case, work led by uh, Sivan Rafaeli Abramson from my group and Sahar Sharif Zadeh from Jeff's group. And you can see that now, if we treat the molecule without this dielectric screening, but the solid with it, then now indeed the molecular gaps are no longer too small. And we're finally able also to capture this renormalization. And we get the right result for the right reason. The right reason being that we finally incorporated the physics of the dielectric response. Here's another application of this idea, in this case, to photo emission spectroscopy. This is quinacridone. It's some derivative of pentacene, which is more air stable and therefore interesting for some electronics and optoelectronics applications. What you see in the top panel here is experimental results. It's ultraviolet photo emission spectroscopy. So to zero order, it's basically a map of the electron energy distributions in the material. Now you can capture that with GW, but actually not so easily. You see that if I do a one shot GW calculation on top of a DFT starting point that is PBE, which is this blue line here, salt is actually not great. And why that is, I'll get to in a moment. If you go to a hybrid functional like HSC and use that as a starting point, which is the bottom panel, the yellow one, that's act, that actually agrees well with experiment. With our optimally tuned screen range separated hybrid, we actually agree with very well with experiment and with the hybrid functional if we, oops, sorry, if we include short range exchange, but we actually even reproduce the bad GW result if we don't, if we stick to alpha equals zero. And not that there's any particular merit in reproducing a bad result, it just, happens. So what's going on here? Why does a hybrid functional or a short or inclusion of, of uh, a Fock exchange in the short range, why is it so important here? Well, it turns out that this has to do with the concept of the self-interaction error that Nicola already explained in his talk, that electrons can be, uh, because of the Hartree term, uh, at least partly uh, spuriously repelled from themselves. And of course, there's no such physics. Electrons should be repelled from other electrons, not from themselves. So you know that in quantum mechanics, there is a long tradition of explaining everything with cats. Uh, we can do that here too. Uh, as you know, cats are somewhat like electrons in the sense that they don't particularly like each other's company. So here is physical repulsion uh, between cats. That's correct. And this is a self-interaction error. It's uh, being repelled from your own image, uh, which you're not supposed to do. And actually, going back to the quinacridone, this is exactly what's happening here. What's happening here is that some orbitals are localized. Therefore, they are repelled from themselves with the simple approaches. They get to be too high in energy as a consequence, and they distort the spectrum. The inclusion of short-range exchange does not eliminate that completely, but it mitigates it enough so that quantitative agreement with experiment can be restored and we can actually see what's going on. And in the sense that we can then interpret the spectrum fully and say which peak is comprised of which orbitals. By the way, for metal organic complexes, this issue is even worse. And then the correction that we use is even more important. I have backup slides that I can show you if you ask me about it later, but now I will just go on. Okay. So that brings me to another point about exact conditions. As you can already see, I like triangles. So we really identified three conditions that are crucial for spectroscopy that again, were also mentioned in, in Nicola's talk. We want freedom from one electron self-interaction errors. We want to have piecewise linearity and we want to have a correct asymptotic potential. Now, because if one disobeys any of these conditions, this can lead to delocalization errors. There is sometimes the perception that they are in fact the same, that they are various manifestations of the same condition. Now, that's absolutely not true. These conditions are not the same. How do I know that? Because again, in this tutorial article that I already mentioned, we show examples where we can obey one of the conditions or even two and still disobey the third. For example, in what I just showed you, the range separated hybrid, at least in simple form, is piecewise linear. It has the correct asymptotic potential, but it's not one electron self interaction free. Artery Fock theory, for example, is one electron self interaction free and has the correct asymptotic potential, but it's not piecewise linear. And one could go on and on. 
So are they related? Partly, and usually what helps one helps others, but they are not the same and they should be thought of separately. And I think that's an important point to make. Let me just mention in passing, again, I can go into more detail if you ask me later, but for molecular solids, we've discovered later that one doesn't even necessarily have to calculate a full solid. One can just immerse a molecule in a polarizable continuum model and get excellent results. But let me just mention it and move on for now with some references. So let's talk about a proper solid, a covalent or an ionic solid, of, you know, of the types that, that Nicola showed in the previous talk. Well, can we use the same optimal tuning uh, criterion just over the unit cell? Well, not so easily, because here's what happens. And this is basically a variation. What you show here is a what I show here is a variation of a proof first given by Wei Tao Yang's group a while ago. So if I now have a supercell comprising of, say, K unit cells, and I remove an electron, that means that I remove one over K of an electron from each of the cells because they are all the same. So now if I write the total energy difference, it's basically K times the energy of the cell missing some of the electron minus K times the energy of the original cell. And if I take the limit of K goes to infinity, a proper solid, I'm just left with a derivative here. The piecewise linear difference became a derivative. So the difference became a derivative. That means that piecewise linearity has degenerated into Yannick's theorem. And Yannick's theorem is trivially obeyed even for approximate functions. So this is always obeyed. So on the one hand, it's nice. I obey the exact criterion. On the other hand, I have lost the ability to use this criterion to distinguish between a good parameter and a bad parameter because everybody's a winner. Everybody obeys it. So I've learned nothing new. The way that this is manifested in practice is that if I take a supercell and I start increasing its size, this delta i, so the uh, difference between the ionization potential and the eigenvalue sh gradually shrinks to zero as I include more and more k points, which means that as a function of gamma, the criterion is always obeyed. The band gap, of course, does change, which means that I don't know how to choose the right gamma. So what I showed you so far, just used as is, will work very nicely for molecules. I hope I have convinced you of that, but it will not work for solids. So at first, we try to see if there is a workaround around this theorem, conditions under which it won't be obeyed. So we found two additional proofs of that in the process, one from ensemble theory, which is this middle reference here, and one from electrostatic considerations, which is the bottom reference here. But the bottom line is that the proof is correct. So this doesn't help us. So what did we do? As a first step, we asked ourselves, okay, is this worth pursuing? In other words, suppose that just for the time being, we do fit the gap, so use a value of gamma that is known to produce the correct band gap. Will that help for quantities such as the optical absorption spectrum? So we thought that the answer would be yes for the following reason, that with standard approaches, you have three major challenges. The uh, underestimation of the band gap, which I already mentioned, the fact that we don't have the correct asymptotic behavior, and that if you use correction terms, it's not so easy to, to derive the correct exchange correlation kernel, which normally is just another derivative, but the question is what to do with the correction. Here we have a proper function, also it's easy. So this was pursued by uh, David Wing from uh, my group and uh, Jonah Haber from Jeff Neaton's group. And here you can see what I mean. You can see, I already showed you in the beginning the optical absorption spectrum of silicon. I showed you that P PBE is not a good descriptor. Now I show you that HSC, a hybrid functional, is not a good descriptor either because it doesn't have the correct asymptotic potential. It's better than PBE, but it's not great. If you use our approach, as I said, for the time being, uh, fitting the gap, so just one parameter, you see that basically uh, time-dependent DFT agrees very well with both experiment and many-body perturbation. Now, this is not a one-off success. In fact, we've seen it before in early work of Sivan Rafaeli Abramson on lithium fluoride, where it's even more spectacular, because there experimentally, it is known that there should be a large excitonic peak at around 13 electron volts or so. GWBSE here in red captures it very nicely. But something like time-dependent LDA is a complete catastrophe. All you get is some smeared out uh, absorption spectrum, the agreement of which with experiment is best described as non-existent. 
And actually, if you use time-dependent DFT with the screen range separated hybrid, you're back in business with a proper exotonic view. Same goes for band structures, very well described across a range of semiconductors. Same for optical absorption in other spectra. I show here the example of aluminum and timonide, which I chose because it has a high spin orbit uh, coupling, which means that the first peak is spin orbit split into two peaks and it continues to be well captured. And overall, it seems like a good idea to do solids this way for both the band structure and the optical absorption spectrum. And the remaining question then is how to get this range separation parameter non empiric So this is newer work that was led by uh, David Wing and Guy Johan. And it goes back to uh, Nicola's work about maximally localized warning functions, which in fact will be discussed uh, uh, later in this uh, workshop. There will be a lecture specifically on that later today, if I recall correctly. And the idea is the following. Remember what the problem was? The problem was that we tried to remove a delocalized electron because the valence band maximum of a typical solid is completely delocalized. And that led us into a vanishing uh, condition. So we should stop doing that. And instead, what we choose to do here is to remove the maximally localized one year function, specifically the one that is highest in energy, instead. Now, this is not an eigenstate, which means that to remove it, we need to use constrained DFT which we can do following the suggestion by Mind Wang in this paper from about six years ago. And again, this uh, leads me to another uh, relation between our, our work and that of Nicola and also of Wei Tao Yang and Alfredo Pascarello, and that is the importance of localization conditions that it just won't work with a delocalized wave function. So we need to localize it somehow. We do it one way, Young does it another way, uh, uh, Marzari a third way, Pascarello a fourth way, but it has to be in there somewhere, somehow. So how we do it is with this constraint, as I mentioned. And then as an ansatz, we assume that now we will want to uh, enforce the same ionization potential condition, except now with this uh, remove one year function. And since it's not an eigenstate, the eigenvalue gets replaced by an expectation value. Well, if we do that, one thing we immediately notice is that now the condition is no longer trivially obeyed. In other words, if we uh, compute this and we ask ourselves, well, is it zero or not? Well, that would depend on your choice of gamma. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't, which is good because that means with, that we can pick a winner. Like before for the molecules, the winner is the one that obeys the condition. So now the sole remaining question is, well, is the winner one that really predicts good band gaps and good uh, optical excitation energies? And the answer is yes. So here we have a bunch of uh, semiconductors and insulators ranging from ones with really small gaps, such as indium antimonide and indium arsenide, and all the way up to large gap insulators such as magnesium oxide or lithium fluoride. And over this range of almost 15 electron volts altogether, if we compare theory and experiment, the mean absolute error is only 0.1 eV and the largest error is 0.2 eV for magnesium oxide, if I'm not mistaken. And what you see in this slide specifically is uh, the y-axis is the computational prediction from this one-year optimally tuned screen drain separated hybrid. And the x-axis is the experimental value corrected for uh, zero-point renormalization contributions. And so perfect agreement between theory and experiment would mean that we were on the y equals x line. And as you can see, we're pretty much there. More recently, uh, through further work of Guy O'Hud and, and co-workers, we've been able to show that the same goes for halide perovskites, which are very interesting materials for solar cell energies. So for solar cell applications, so for energy applications. Again, same idea. We have a delocalized valence band maximum that doesn't help us. We take the maximally localized one-year function. Now it is properly localized. And now we can get good band gaps and also uh, good band structures, which are uh, comparable to what one would get, in this case, from actually self-consistent GW calculations. Uh, more recently, this is actually, we're writing this up as I speak. If I now apply this to uh, optical absorption spectra, say of uh, oxides that are uh, optically important, such as zinc oxide, titanium dioxide, and alumina, 
we see excellent agreement between theory and experiment with no, adjust, no empirical parameters whatsoever and at a fraction of the cost of a GWBSE calculation, especially for zinc oxide, which happens to be a hard case for GWBSE. And here, it's just another material. Really. And one more thing I would like to point out is that if you think about it in G naught W naught, so one so-called one shot GW theory, there is always the question of what should we use as the starting point. And in this uh, recent work led by Stephen Gant from uh, Jeff uh, Neaton's group, we argued that in some sense, what we do is the optimal starting point because we already have something very close to the correct band gap. So from a simple logic of perturbation theory that says that, well, the closer uh, your guess is to the actual solution, the better perturbation theory would work. We expect this to be useful. So we did G naught W naught on top of various starting points. And we found that indeed the best one is this one E optimal tuned functional. And uh, somewhat to our surprise, I must say, we found that doing this one shot calculation on top of the optimal starting point is actually even more accurate than doing self-consistent GW. And you can see that very clearly for lithium fluoride here or for magnesium oxide where uh, uh, self-consistent GW, which is the purple and the yellow, these are two different types of self-consistency are actually overestimating by quite a good bit. And our result is actually almost completely on the line. So that brings me almost to the end, but I would like to point out one important thing. And that is that our approach, like any other approach has some advantages. I hope I was able to convey some of you, some of them to you today, but there are also limitations and I would be doing a poor job if I wouldn't describe uh, some of those as well. I would say that so far, the limitations that we found can be uh, divided into two categories. One is strong heterogeneity, which means that I have a really heterogeneous system where one part of the system should be described by one range separation parameter and another by another. We first noted that with the somewhat artificial case of stretched heterodimers. And then we went on to show that this is an issue for a more realistic case of a molecule metal interface, where we also offered some partial solutions in these two articles. And then as Nicola was also mentioning in, 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 uh, in relation to the methods that he was showing, all of this is fiddling with exchange. So if there's very strong correlation, we would be in trouble again. We noticed that first for oxide clusters and shortly thereafter also for spin crossover complexes. And recently, we've offered optimal tuning of a double hybrid functional as a preliminary solution, at least for molecules. But of course, there's still a long road uh, to get to the same point with strong correlation. So these are two limitations that one should be aware of. So as I just said, uh, the road is still long. Nevertheless, I think one can argue that density functional theory and its extension to the excited state, time-dependent density functional theory, can quantitatively predict various issues that are usually thought to be outside its realm that have to do with spectroscopy, namely molecular gaps and solid state band gaps, gap renormalization of molecular solids, among other things, band structure and excitonic line shapes in solids, photoemission spectra, charge transfer excitation energies in both molecules and solids, and more. So with this, I will end, but not before uh, thanking the group, which of course are the ones that do the hard work that makes it possible. Some of the funding sources that supported uh, uh, this work over the last 10 years or so. And of course, you for your attention. And I'll be very happy to take questions and uh, points for discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lior. And um... I will pass on to questions. I, we have a few questions from uh, from attendees. Uh, the first one uh, from Nicola Colonna um, <clears throat> says, uh, am I correct in saying that generalized conscious theory can correctly reproduce only the homo energy or say frontier orbitals as in standard conscious DFT? Could you comment on the meaning of the orbital energy of states different from the homo or lumo? Yes, thank you. That, that is a fantastic question. Let me uh, answer this uh, in two parts. First, rigorously, yes. 
rigorously, we are enforcing our condition on the homo energy, and therefore the homo energy is where we are sure it will apply. This does not mean, however, that the rest of the eigenvalues have no meaning whatsoever. As we have seen, for example, in the guanacridone example, we can get the entire photo emission spectrum. Now, why is that? This actually goes back to a very interesting and long-standing debate within DFT, and that is what is the meaning of the other orbitals. So if you're a purist, you would say that they have no meaning because they are not exactly the ionization potential, and that is correct. That is in fact That has in fact been shown by Jones and Gunnarsson a long time ago. There's this picture which is buried somewhere deep within their... Uh, 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 overview article from 1989, and it compares VXC and proper self-energies for the one case where we actually know the exact density functional, which is the uniform electron gas, because their LDA is not an approximation, it's actually an exact result. And you see that, well, the two curves are not the same, so VXC does not describe uh, the self-interaction, I'm sorry, the self-energy correction uh, correctly. However, you can also see that depending on the density, there may be a wide region near the Fermi surface where it's actually still a pretty reasonable approximation. And I would say that this is what really makes us successful in many cases. With your permission, let me show one more example of that. This is something that I mentioned briefly, but now allows me to show it in more detail. So this is, for example, copper phthalocyanin, which is a fairly hard case for, because uh, it's been polarized and it's metal organic and there are actually severe self-interaction errors, even more severe than in the example that I showed. And you can see that even with GW, where again, GW on top of PDE is a bad idea because it can't shake off very serious self-interaction errors. But with optimal tuning, we can actually get not just the homolumo gap correctly, we can get a very good description that is almost uh, uh, on the level of GW uh, over a range of several electron volts lower and higher than the highest occupied state and the lowest unoccupied state respectively. And we can really assign the spectrum that way. So I would say that this is a typical result. So to summarize in one sentence, this may be long answer to Nicola's question, other eigenvalues beyond the HOMO and maybe the LUMO, if you have really minimized the derivative discontinuity, don't have a rigorous meaning, but they can still serve as very successful approximations, especially because in the presence of the non-multiplicative operator, we're actually doing a better job at approximating the self-energy than with the conscient potential. So I hope that was uh, uh, that answered the question. Thank you. Um... A second question uh, from uh, Aldo Golotti um, is, is the following. What about the transferability of optimized functionals? How strong is the dependency of the optimized parameters on the different chemical environments of the same atom? Right, okay, so that's again an excellent question. And here I would say this goes to a, back to a more philosophical issue as well. So let me go back to that one second. So even right here, where we actually fit the parameter. So the question is really, well, how different is it for different molecules? So it can be, it can vary quite a good bit between values that are say 0.1 or even 0.05 and values that are as large as 0.4 or 0.5 for some atoms or some really small molecules. And again, and if we screen the, the uh, functional, which we don't do for molecules, but we can do and we should do for solids, there is also variability in the dielectric screening. Electric screening can be, the dielectric uh, constant can be of the order of say two or three for some insulators, but 10 or 12 for some semiconductors. So definitely the parameters do change. Now, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, it's a bit of both. Philosophically, it's a bad thing because there is a universal functional and we would like the universal functional to describe everything with, uh, you know, without having to bother with each system separately. But we don't know the exact functional and we will probably continue not to know. It. 
So here with a simple step, we figure out what are the relevant parameters for our system in the non-empirical way. You can think of it as the range separation parameter and the dielectric constant being themselves functionals of the density. And then the bonus is that we can keep a relatively simple functional form, which we have here. It's a range separated hybrid, and maybe it's more somewhat more general form, which we saw below here. But it's relatively simple. In the end, it's just a range separated hybrid functional. And with it, we can cover a very large range of uh, electronic and optical properties in a very large range of molecules and solids because those parameters, epsilon and gamma, naturally adapt themselves to the system at hand using the uh, constraints that I have mentioned. So it's both a good thing and a bad thing, depending on how you look at it. Practically, I think it's a good thing. I see. Thank you. Uh, let me ask the next question uh, from Andreas, Andres Ortega Guerrero. Uh, what were the different conditions you took into account for transition metal complexes on optimally and optimally attuning method? Right. Okay, another great question. So if we go for example, for example, back to this uh, copper PC or copper phthalocyanin example that I show that I showed a moment ago. So the only thing that one has to be a little bit careful about here is that this is an open shell system. So one has to remove an electron from one spin channel and make sure that the difference in density is commensurate in spin with the difference with the electron removal. Other than that, and by the way, that's not because it's metal organic, that's because it's open shell. You have to do that whenever you have an open shell. Other than that, there is no difference whatsoever. It's the same procedure and the exact same way to determine the range separation parameter. And, uh, and that's the beauty of it, that it continues to work. And it continues to describe, to give you a good uh, balance between uh, uh, localized orbitals and delocalized orbitals. By the way, just to demonstrate how bad it is for copper phthalocyanin, if you do copper phthalocyanin with, with DFT, then depending on the functional that you will use, you will get one of two results. Either the A1U orbital is on top and B1G is below it. So this one is the homo and this one is the lumo or the other way around. And commensurately, either the other spin part of the B1G is the lumo like here, or it isn't like here. Now, both can be justified chemically, but clearly not, not both of them can be correct. At most, one of them can be correct. So which is the correct one? So it turns out that the one on the right is what you will always get with a semi-local functional, a GGA, like PBE or BLIP. The one on the left is what you will get with a hybrid functional, no, almost no matter which kind. And basically the one on the left is the correct one. That's also the one that we predict with our range separated hybrid approach. And why is it? Because here there are really huge self-interaction errors amounting to more than one electron volts, uh, one electron volt with a GGA, and they are so large that they push this localized orbital so far high that it becomes spuriously the homo, and therefore it pulls its counterpart down to become the lumo. Of course, it's pretty bad if you're trying to describe, say, the reactivity of a molecule that you misidentify both frontier orbitals. So this is an extreme example of a self-interaction error and how important it can be, and we discussed it in, in these articles down here. And again, in a, in a range-separated uh, hybrid approach with a non-zero alpha, it plays out naturally and you get the right answer for the right reason. And it agrees very well with photo emission and inverse photo emission. Very nice, thank you. Uh, one more question we have from the audience, uh, uh, precisely from Manuel Dos Santos Diaz. Uh, what if we don't know uh, at the start, if the material is a metal or an insulator, what would happen if this formalism is applied to a metal? Right. So if we apply it to the to a metal, first of all, we will see, we will, well, there are two possibilities. If we use an enormous amount of Fock exchange, we can spuriously turn a metal into an insulator. We know that because we know, for example, that if we take Hartree-Fock theory and apply it to some metals, then the erroneous prediction is that it's actually an insulator. 
So if we use too much, we will clearly see that. But if uh, uh, we follow the procedure, we haven't done much of that yet. So some of it is speculation. I think we need to do more calculations to show this in practice, but we think it will just degenerate to a, either a tiny gap or a complete closure of the gap. And the reason I believe that to be the case, so, but that is because if I go back to this slide here, we saw that where we have cases which are almost metallic, here the gap is only 0 0.2 electron volts. So it's technically a semiconductor, but a really narrow gap semiconductor, which therefore has, by the way, applications in far infrared spectroscopy, uh, then we can still capture that. So we can follow the gap down to its closure. But we really do have to do some proper methods to show that this is really happening in, in, in practice. It's on our to-do list. Thank you. I think uh, we are done with questions from the the audience. Uh, he, uh, since there is more time, I will ask uh, one or two questions myself. Sure. So uh, you talked at the beginning uh, <clears throat> about generalized quantum theory. And uh, as far as I as far as I understand, the multi-reference nature of the wave function, possible multi-reference nature, is still inside the correlation term, right? Uh, it's not explicited explicited in any term. Uh, That's uh, right. In other words, if I go back to that slide, yeah, here it is. Well, yeah. at least for the simple well, no, this one. Yeah, exact hybrid theory. One can also do in a similar way exact a range separated hybrid, but let's settle for this. So indeed the basic idea of mapping to a single Slater determinant is still there. Yeah. And all of the correlation that was previously, well, basically in V correlation, mm -hmm. and maybe somewhat in V exchange, depending on how exactly you define correlation, all of this is now in this remainder potential. Yeah, but is there any general scheme to, you know, to build a generalized Quantum theory, where you take uh, some explicit account of the possible multi reference nature of the wave function. So, what you can do, and we've done a little bit of that, we're getting started, is to uh, marry generalized quantum theory with ensemble DFT. Because okay. ensemble yeah, DFT, yeah. in this case for, for excited states, so the so called Gross Oliveira Con ensemble, is the one theory that really lets you treat. Uh, multiple configurations. Yeah. And then you can combine that with generalized quantum theory. There are some complications in how it's it's done, but it can be done. And, and actually in this JCAMF's paper, we show the relevant proofs and some numerical examples. Very nice. So I think that's where you want to go if if you're, you know, uh, if you're facing issues that require this type of treatment. But that's in very early stages of development. Yeah. Another question I have is on the pigment system. The on one that, sorry? The, the, the pigment, the mm -hmm. rainbow um, error that you right, mentioned. So this one. So in, um, in a paper by Stefano Baroni's group, uh, there was uh, also a study of a pigment, and they showed that the Basically, the absorption properties uh, critically depend on the on the configuration explored uh, in water environment. Do you get the same here, or uh, or it, the result is independent of what uh, the conformation of the molecule is? So, in this case, well, this this is not my work, but as best I remember from reading this paper, in this case, the effect of the environment was much weaker. But in principle, you're absolutely right. And by the way, this is a common source of, of mistakes that people make when they compare theory to experiment. That they do say a gas phase calculation, yeah. which may be perfect as far as the electronic structure of the gas phase is concerned, but then they compare it to <clears throat> either a solid state experiment or to an experiment in solution where the solvent so it can be polar or it can interact chemically with the molecule and makes a difference. And then they either reach the conclusion that the electronic structure theory was not good when in fact it was, 
or there is some cancellation of errors that cause accidental agreement and then one gets maybe the right answer but for the wrong reason so one i totally agree with you that one has to be really really careful and when comparing theory and experiment make sure that they are under comparable conditions as much as possible thank you uh, maybe i can ask one last question sure please um this sort of philosophical one um so you show the necessity of using a vanier function and localized basis set in order to to approach a problem in a, a you know extended uh, periodic system mm -hmm. doesn't that bother you i mean that the way that the, the fact that uh, you know you have to use a specific uh, basis set and not uh, and so doesn't that bother that you cannot write uh, your correction uh, in uh, in a general enough way to to work well with any basis set for so first of all yes it does yeah. uh, but i would say two things first we found that this in practice works very well uh, and we think we understand why, because we have to get away from the delocalization. In our experience, I would say there are several things going for this, though. One is that we found that the choice of the result is not terribly dependent on the choice of which specific one function we're using. Mm -hmm. If it were super sensitive, that just means it's not a good idea. And second, the important thing here is that this is not exactly a correction term. Rather, what it boils down to is a way to choose the parameters in this partition, specifically to choose gamma. Mm -hmm. Now, once we have chosen gamma, whether it's through this method or through whatever method we may or may not have in the future, it becomes a proper density functional with some choice of parameters. It may be a good approximation, it may be a bad one, but it's well-defined. And from here on, it's just standard density functional within the generalized Konsham theory for this particular choice of parameters. So this procedure, in our case, is not a way to select. And by the way, that's where it differs from the original suggestion of mind one, for example, who really used it to construct a correction term. We don't use it to construct the correction term. We use it to select a parameter. Once the parameter okay. has been selected, so so to speak, we it's a ladder to get to the parameter, and once we have it, we can throw the ladder away and just keep. Okay, working. okay. Thank you very much, and um, thank you very much for giving this a uh, very nice, very interesting talk. Thank you. And uh, I think we are just on time, and we need to move to the to the next presentation.